Hello, Bill Wadman. Hello, Sandy. Two weeks in a row. Yeah. What did we even do last week? I mean... What do we even do between when we're talking? <laughs> I don't know, but I've been drunk. Okay, apparently. <laughs> I have really. not, but let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, so top topper, um, a term yes. you have not heard before until this evening. Do you want to explain it to our audience? Cheers. Uh, uh, chin chin, as, as, as you're wont to say. Uh, th uh, apparently, it's, it's a drunkard. <laughs> Just Something one which I have no all. experience of, so I can't even, I can't even comment <laughs> on this one, but this will be interesting. Well, it is interesting speaking to people who don't drink, and I don't drink very much, but actually the last two times at least we've been on on to each other, I have been drinking alcohol when we've spoken. And you found they've been better shows? What are, what are you? <laughs> no, not at all. It's just totally coincidentally in my life of not really drinking very much um, that I've found recently. I suppose I've been drinking at odd times or for different reasons than the usual celebration. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I find that alcohol does create a lovely, warm, fuzzy glow around the world. Oh, that's the point. Mm, it is the point. And it, it makes it seem like it must be a good thing. I was going to say bearable, but yes, yours is better. <laughs> No, no, the, but the actual drinking itself, you know, to kind of justify oh, it, it yeah. becomes a good thing. You know, if if everything becomes nicer, sure, then how can it be bad? And of course, we know why drinking is so terribly bad. It's very bad for our health. It's usually very bad for our relationships. Mm -hmm. And yet, so many of us do it. It's true. Mm. Well, there's lots of things people do that are bad for you. Yes, but you aren't a drinker. You never drink alcohol. Correct. And I have another friend who never drinks. And I wonder about that. What's that like? <laughs> never drink. Well, it's kind of like proving a negative, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, in my own head or socially? Socially. Uh, used to be much more of a big deal than it is now. Do people question the, it? Uh, sometimes. Some people assume that you must have been a drinker before and you stopped drinking, yeah. which is true of a lot of people. I've never drank, so I have no uh, experience in this. Um, so I think there are people who say, oh, Bill doesn't drink. He, he must have been an alcoholic and he quit, you know, that kind of thing. I, I think uh, this is a very what, interesting aspect of it, actually. I want to come to it in a minute about um, gender and drinking. Sure. Um, when I say I don't drink, or I don't really drink, I don't drink that much, nobody ever questions it. Whereas I do I perceive... They question men. Yeah, but whereas men who don't drink, it's seen as much, much more unusual. Uh, yeah, I think, it, and I think time has changed. Uh, when I was in college in the mid-90s, uh, it was a time when me not drinking, I was very much an outlier and... Mm not outcast because of that, but certainly, you know, not invited to play the reindeer games as much. Um, yeah. Where at least half of the people that hang out with my wife and I, my wife drinks, but like uh, half the people in our sort of friend group don't drink just by chance, you know, not like we. So I think that it's, there's a lot, there's a lot less of that pressure than there used to be. I wonder also, I mean, you are also in, a, in even more of a drinking culture than America is. Uh, well, certainly, but growing up in Scotland, yes. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, the Scots and the Irish can really put it away. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. And there is a, an English drinking culture, and I perceive a lot of um, unfortunate drinking here in the south of England, especially in the summer months uh, and in Bournemouth at the beach. Uh, the drinking yeah. to excess of not just young people, but really of everybody's kind of grotesque yeah um, it's also interesting when you're around people who can't seem to have an open conversation without a few drinks mm -hmm. you know i could sit down and have a really deep conversation about really heavy things in my life 
without being drunk, but it seems like there are people for whom that's an impossibility or their, their filters are too strong or, you know, something. So it's, it's interesting. I also don't like being around people who are like visibly or noticeably drunk because that's no, no fun no. either. No. Um, it's, it's very, uh, uh, it is a chaotic feeling. A drunk being that drunk or being drunk at all? Being around somebody who is very drunk. Yeah. It's not just that they are chaotic. It's yep. that it breeds chaos. Yes, very much so. Mm. In in them and the people around them. Yes. Yep. I don't know this painting. Not many people do. And I mean, it sold at auction for million i mean it's a pretty painting it's a very interesting painting actually because it's one of these paintings that sits still <laughs> it really does sit still and if one sits still with it then there is a different give to it a different gift in what we see uh, in my experience of it anyway well i mean one one of them seems to be unconscious there's also a sense, especially the guy on the left, where it's like there's, um, I always use the term, but like low potential energy. It seems like he's very grounded in his chair. Mm. You know, like nothing is changing in this. If you set, if this was a real scene, he'd just be sitting there staring into space like that. Yes. And I mean, there are two versions of this. One is, uh, it's actually the 19... 10 painting that sold for a lot of money. I suspect this one will have sold at auction for lots of money as well. But this is the kind of, I think, warmer seeming of the two paintings, okay. the same topic. Uh, the drunkard, James Ensor, Flemish painter. Um, he never really went anywhere, this artist, which is interesting about him. It's, it's kind of funny because like, I look at this and it's it's it has very Cezanne kind of feels like a card players -y kind of era time feel to me. Well, it is of that era, I suppose. Yeah. Um, it's also kind of coincidental with Van Gogh. And there's something of mm -hmm. Van Gogh in it. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a feeling of Degas. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would be able to find and reach a lot of other artists through it. That doesn't mean that James Ensor himself was particularly well informed about them. Although actually, you know, he, he was an interested artist in that he liked looking at art, but he, as I said, he didn't really travel around very much. And I think the, the, the furthest he ever went was he maybe four days worth of London. <laughs> uh, and that was it. Where was he, he mostly? He was in uh, Belgium and in Ostend. And I think he was born there and I think he died there. Uh, he lived a, a good age. I mean, 1949, he died, 1860. Uh, what does that make him? 89. An old man, a long life. Yeah. But anyway, I don't think people ever see him as a particularly kind of satirical painter or a painter that has a political message. But this painting actually does in that, uh, if not political, certainly social, there's some kind of comment on class in this painting. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was, was the temperance movement of the late 19th and early 20th century in America also equally strong in the UK? No. No, hmm. I wouldn't say so. I like this. The colors are beautiful. I love this painting. Um, it's big as well. It's quite a big painting. Um, you were doing six by four, maybe. Isn't it? I mean, two things. One, you say he didn't travel much, right? Mm. So he didn't see that much art. And this is before, I mean, yes, there were mechanical copies of paintings, but if you saw anything, it would be an engraving or black and white version of something. Maybe you weren't going to see a color reproduction of a Van Gogh, right? So, well, you wouldn't have been seeing a Van Gogh anyway. Yeah, 
But I'm just saying, like, even if you did see some sort of etching or some drawing or some photograph of one of them, it would be black and white. Right. You know, so it's, it's just interesting to imagine, like, all of these artists saw a sort of one dimensional version of so many other pieces of art. They just they didn't have the color aspect. And yet the color in this is so beautiful. And the color in all the other artists you just listed is generally one of their strong suits. Now, you know, cool. we, we talked last time really about how we know people to have seen, you know, the, the way people actually saw the world wasn't just affected by experience in as much as they perceived actions in a different context. There's also a sense that maybe they really did actually visibly or they actually did see the visual reality maybe differently i don't i don't know i mean also let's face it the colors in this really remind me of belgium <laughs> sure but you i mean know, go ahead no it's just that you know sometimes our it is our physical experience that comes to play in in the input output of our of our art I, yeah, what I find interesting is that if you imagine 100 years prior to this, you know, 1783, and you go 100 years later, 18 or 1983, or 50 years on either side, you wouldn't see a painting like this, that that this guy, whether or not he saw a lot of other art, was painting in a style, in a way with colors, with shades that were part of the current painting zeitgeist, whether or not he was very well educated in other painters of the time. No, I don't mean to say he wasn't well educated, Bill. I just mean to say that I find it interesting when people don't travel a lot. If, if, yeah, fair enough. I mean, uh, yes, I, but you, and you that's get my not point, about though, seeing yeah. art. That's not about seeing art necessarily. That's just about living and seeing people. Yeah, but if, but if he wasn't, let's say for the moment that like he just he wasn't having the same experience as all those other people necessarily. And yet he made something that was definitely in the, in the same style, same world as a lot of those other artists were working in. Mm. That's kind of weird that like, is there some sort of, you know, this is the way artists see the world for these 20 years, you know, with a curve on either side. And, and that's why people painted that way for that time and not okay. before. What do you think about the commentary about class in this? Um, well, I mean, the classic thing of like, oh, see, poor people are a bunch of drunks and that's why they're poor. Mm. I mean, that's, that's, we, we've, we've seen that in paintings from 1660, you know. Um, but is there anything comedic about this? I mean, do you think that Ensor is in any way humiliating these two men? I think this painting is sad. I don't see it. I mean, you could read it as commentary or satire or, or any of these other things. I personally see it as sad, but I am also, I come at this topic from a very specific point of view. Um, having you know, had an alcoholic parent and stuff. I just, you know, I have, I have very specific feelings about all this kind of stuff. Um, but I certainly don't see anything comedic in it. No. Um, <clears throat> do you, I mean, I, do you? No, I don't at all. In fact, I find this um, very poignant, very touching. It's very, like, as you said at the beginning, I think your first word's like still, like it feels like, like a long moment, yeah. you know, like a, like an extended moment. The poster in the background advertises the sale of an estate due to bankruptcy. Am I supposed to be able to read that or is that just that you know that because the commentary says so? I just know that about the painting. That's cool. And, and the reason why I know that is because Ensor came from a quite well-to-do family, but his family fell on hard times and his family went through an estate sale. And he painted this just afterwards. So maybe he was, maybe he is one of these people. He's on the, he's on the bottom end of, of a collapse, you know? I mean, there is something, I mean, so, 
real and humble or humbling about this feat. I was just looking at the guy on the right, the way his right heel is up out of the clog or whatever he's wearing. Mm. It's like, and it's like kind of twisted at the ankle. Uh, I've seen this, haven't you? I've seen it. I know it. I recognize yeah. it. I mean, both of them, it's it's almost like um, they're not placing their feet and putting pressure on them. It's like their feet ended up where they were and the weight of their body twisted their feet to maintain balance. Mm. I also like the way the guy on the, the, the left was holding his leg. See, this is a very different view of something like this. Joan Mitchell. What do you think of this one? It's not that I think anything particularly about this painting per se in the archive of Mitchell's work. Okay. It's, it's more that this rock bottom yep. coincides with various things that were going on for her at the time. Mm -hmm. and, and for those people who don't know Joan Mitchell, Joan Mitchell uh, was an abstract expressionist working alongside at the same time as the great titans, male titans of abstract expressionism in that bully boy. Uh, bully it's physical boy. work, Sandy. <laughs> Women can't understand it. <laughs> um, and she not only held her own, but she was a celebrated artist in her time. She was the first woman to have a solo exhibition at, uh, you know, in uh, what's the main Parisian contemporary art gallery? I can't remember, but she was the first pioneer. We ought to celebrate, recognize. The reason why she's here is at rock bottom, the truth of it is, is that she was a total drunkard. Alcohol propelled her through her adult life and also decimated her. I mean, the the disease that ravaged her body eventually was highly likely because of her lifestyle. Sure. And that drunkenness, I used the word propel, you know, also was quite repellent as well. Mm -hmm. Joan Mitchell had many friends, but they were friends who were also maybe often drunk. I think a lot of those guys were drunk for a lot of the time. Indeed. But again, here we come to the idea of gender and drinking. And in art, as with drinking, you know, we have an expectation that painting like this is by a man. Yep. Yep. And that drinking, as she did, is of a man. It's interesting that, like, the, despite the title and the, the, the work that I've seen of hers, this is not more or less chaotic than a lot of her other work to me. You know what I mean? No, and that's why I think, you know, why did you call this rock bottom? Yeah. And, and that's why I'm, I'm sure that it is really because of her departure from the U.S., the mess made by her many failed love affairs mm -hmm. and wrecked friendships, you know, the kind of swing door of being so drunk. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was horribly irascible as well. She was often to be found, you know, shouting, ranting, uh, getting into fights. In, in my experience, to people who have gone through that in their life or are going through it in their life. There's usually not just one rock bottom moment. Right. I mean, does drinking actually make art? Is drinking you know. a key ingredient? You know, was heroin a key ingredient for Basquiat was, you know, I don't know. It just seems that so many of our celebrated artists, have had 
used chemicals to get there. Uh, you know, very difficult, very powerful relationships sure. with alcohol or other kind yeah. of substance abuse issues. I mean, I think, I think that maybe it's, it, it's, it comes the opposite direction. I don't think that they're alcoholics. I don't think they're artists because they're alcoholics. I think they're alcoholics because they're artists and they're artists because they may think or perceive things. Maybe, maybe they're more, more sensitive to things in the world and they're more hurt by them. And therefore they start drinking or doing whatever it is in order to cover that up, you know, all these kinds of stories. Well, that's, um, I mean, my question is, do we drink to forget or to become? Uh, to forget. I know so in many people opinion. who believe that they become. Yeah, they believe that. And, and I evidence, I would... Suggest, Bill, evidence would suggest actually that a lot of people do come into being or the sure. being they recognize through drink. Sure. Yes. Yes. The being they recognize. And, you know, I, I once met with a very, I, I once photographed a very well-known jazz pianist and I was talking to him during the shoot. What? I'm just saying he was a heavy and I asked him about drugs and he says, he said, I, you know, I used to, I used to do cocaine. And I said, Oh, that's interesting. I said, used to, why'd you stop? And he said in the 1980s, he goes, I used to have a cassette deck on the piano when I played and I used to hit record and I used to like do my gig and I did a gig at the village Vanguard and he's like, and I killed it that night. Absolutely killed it. Best show of my life. He's like, and then I listened to it the next day and it was awful. Mm. And he's like, and I never touched the stuff again. Cause I realized that like my perception of what was going on when I was high in this case, uh, was different than the reality. W would, would Pollock have been able to make all that stuff if he wasn't drunk? Well, he wasn't drunk for periods of that time. <clears throat> well, for, you know, moments I almost don't there. want to sully Joan Mitchell's slide with talk of Pollock. Okay. Okay. Let's say Joe Mitchell. I'm yeah. sure there were times when she was not drunk and made work. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think yeah. in her okay. case, I think in her case, genuinely, she was drunk sure. for decades. Yeah. Mm. Do you, isn't that sad though? God, that feels so, uh, I don't know. I, I find that very, I don't even know how to put it. Well, what are, you know, what are our judgments? What are they? I think that there are a lot of people, there's a big part of the world who would say, who cares how she got there? She got there and she made this great work. And if she thinks she needed alcohol, it's her life to lead and she could be loaded and, and, and make this art and this art exists after she's gone. Right, sure, so that's, a, a legacy. that's a valid, sure, that's a valid way of looking at it. Uh, she sounds like she wasn't a particularly happy person during it. I Question think is, would you rather have the art, you know? Or, well, I think, I think at times she would have been a horrible person, a deeply unlikable yes. person. Yeah. But those are my conditions. Meeting a yeah. history of somebody who I cannot experience vitally. Okay. Um, um, I think then I become a horrible judge and an unfair judge. If, if my experience were her experience, I would be exactly the same as her. Perhaps, yeah. No, it's not perhaps. It's actually the truth. If you really look so you think it's that, inevitable? No, I'm not saying there's an inevitability about it. I'm saying it's inevitable in Joan Mitchell. And okay. should I ever find myself somehow transmogrified into being Joan Mitchell, I also will be a drunk. Yeah. Okay. And it's only the ego that says, I wouldn't behave like this. What a load of baloney. Well, you wouldn't be you, you'd be her, right? So yeah. But in the same conditions, I would be her. Yeah, but you, that's assuming that those conditions automatically lead to that. I think there's some measure of free will involved. You know, I mean, otherwise everything's just 
predetermined and then it's funny the light flickering on your cheekbones it's really funny um yeah but the the predetermined the predestination theory as it were mm -hmm. that that you're bringing up i mean yeah true maybe does that make it any less sad let me ask you a question i think we could agree that it's kind of sad right are you trying to railroad me bill no no, no. i my my question is if we could agree on sad can we agree on pathetic or is that going a step too far? i haven't yet agreed with sad okay do you not find it sad that she seemingly spent her adult life drunk uh, do I find it sad that she's a pioneering artist of such excellent caliber? Well, uh, it goes back to whether or not she needed to drink to be a pioneering artist of such excellent caliber. And does that make you misjudge her work? Does no. her drink problem make you misjudge her work? Do, no, you meet, do you meet her afresh each time you see one of her paintings? Or do you bring the back catalogue of her drunkenness to it? I... I think anytime you know anything about the artist, you bring some of that into your viewing of their art. I'm sorry, can I can I say we would not be having this conversation in quite this way about Pollock. Sorry to Sully again, dear Joan, on your slide. That horrible man. You're you're saying we give more of a pass to the pea guy than we do to her? Of course. Why? Because she's because he's a look man. At our history. Look at the wheel. Right. Look, at, look at the wheel that turns within a history that speaks to, you know, the superior man. And I, you know, this is in the first painting. It really, I was thinking about poverty, about class, about things mm -hmm. that determine that oh, it's okay because they're poor. Or look at them as you say, the drunken yeah. poor. And here we well, are. I was saying that that's what other people say. I wasn't saying that that's what I think. I'm saying that's the that's the common interpretation of, of that kind of thing. Well, can we also I, I, I be honest? You know, let's be honest. Is there an equation, a conflation in your mind mm -hmm. between the masculine, the poor, and the drunk? Uh, in my mind, definitely the masculine and the drunk, but again, that's my own cross to bear. But, but, and, and but not that it then means that, you know, the masculine drunk gets a prize. It's not what I'm saying. But yeah. I, I wonder to be aware of these things when we yeah. look at the art by people we know to have had what we might call a drink problem. Sure. That a whole host of judgment comes out about their work, even. Sure. Now, Ensor, the painter, wasn't known as a drunk, but that he painted right. drunkards to make some kind of comment or create a commentary around poverty. Or maybe they were just an interesting subject and he was at the pub. I, I guess my, my feeling is, despite the fact that I'm a great fan of art, mm -hmm. right, and enjoy art, and it's one of the things that I live for, if I could snap my fingers like Thanos and say, you know what? We, Joan Mitchell turns out she didn't drink and she was a much happier person, had better relationships in life, but we never had her paintings. And this is true of the P guy or Basquiat or whoever else you want to list as like some addict of uh, who, who made art. I would be all right with losing their art for them to be a, a happier person, you know? But there's people who would say, well, you know what, whatever it took for them to give us this stuff and put that into culture, I, I don't go that far, you know? Those are creepy. Mm. What, are, what are the, uh, are these advertisements? Yeah. I mean, Biro, Mihaly Biro is a very famous poster artist. Um, not, not just for its Zwack company, yep. which, by the way, is lots of fun to say, Zwack. Zwack. Um, but these are some the high of the, heels on the, on the king, that's cool. See, these are some of the best known of the posters for uh, Unicamp. 
which is so you can still buy. What is it? What kind of booze is it? It's a liqueur made of uh, 66 herbs, never disclosed, family recipe, highly secret. What does it taste like? I have no idea. I was going to buy some just to have a good I thought, I thought you were going to drinking it right now. That would be awesome if you were like, actually, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, no. But I think advertising alcohol is an interesting It's thing. fascinating. Because in adver alcohol advertisements, everyone's always having a good time. No one's ever painting really depressing abstract expressionist paintings called rock bottom or themselves passed out at a pub in 1883. No, but isn't it interesting to have the drowning man? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that one's interesting. A, he's having a properly shit time, right? Yeah. But this is the thing that brings him back. Well, yes, even if momentarily before he slips to death in the watery it's, grave. It's kind of dark. Mm, it is. And I wonder if Beto was actually saying, you know, regardless of this, this isn't the, this isn't the way, this isn't the thing. I don't know. You know, it's actually kind of funny about it. You know, like, um, sort of, uh, uh, reefer madnessy kind of cartoons they would do of like, you know, somebody with, heroin or something you know what i'm talking about these like sort of like negative you know uh, uh cautionary tale kind of things drawings yeah. that people do it's funny it's like these could be that if you yeah. just took them in a different light and yet it's supposed to be a positive thing it's well, really think, kind of dark the more you think about it well this is also though about you know the conditions of of origin you know in the 1910s 1920s in hungary there, there was a need for some kind of balm. Yeah. So alcohol is a balm. Well, you were just saying, you were talking about Irish and Scottish, and it's like these are places where it's really gray and sad a lot of the time, you know? But but also, again, an overlap with poverty. Sure. Also, where there's often yeah. a sense of hopelessness. We can't have all those things, but at least we can have this. And frankly, I mean, it's also an environmental thing. When you are somewhere that is cold and dark, you want to be warmed. Sure. You want things to glow. Yep. So I think maybe I could be kinder in my mind. The guy in the right hand advertisement, it's like this mani the maniacal look in his face is like, it's disturbing. Give the guy a break, he's drowning. I know. And this is what he's worried about? No, I mean, you'd reach for a drink, wouldn't you, if you could? Yeah, probably not going to feel it before you're dead. They are dark. They seem to hold some kind of riddle or secret. Yeah. But would it make yeah, I've, I've never seen to drink? It is beautiful. I mean, just these these kind of hand painted advertisements like this are just so beautiful. Mm. Well, you look. Like, at I'd love to see the original. You know, you should look at Beto's work. The archive is extraordinary. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm. It's it's so interesting too when there are uh, uh, especially illustrators, advertising illustrators, commercial illustrators, where their work you know, really straddles the line between fine art and, and, and commercial art, you know, mm -hmm. like remove the text and these are beautiful images, regardless of what their use is for, you know? Yes. Regardless of what their use is for. And, 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 and the, the skill it took to create them, of course, even the, typ the typography alone is just mm -hmm. really beautiful. So, Bill, just before we finish, can I check again? Sure. You have never been drunk. No, I've never drank more than a sip of anything. I know what things taste like, but I've never drank more than enough to know what it tastes like. I drank two, two sips of like a eighth of an inch of champagne on New Year's this year which is the most I've ever drank. Mm. See, you're judging me. 
not especially no I am thinking mm. about it and I, I'm judging myself more I think in context of what you said yeah it's just I just I know me you know it's better it's better this way for everyone in my life indeed anyway, yeah. thank you Bill thank you cheers cheers <laughs>